Welcome to the Green Grind Podcast, where we discuss real experience, real struggles, and real business. My name is Leroy Maines. I'm with Brilliant Borders Landscaping, and we have Corey Ballard with Perfect Cut Site Management Ballard Innovative Products. As always, we have Kaz, who's the brains of this thing, getting it from our mouth to your ears and now eyes. Just a friendly reminder that the Green Grind is sponsored by Jobber. Today, Corey and I are talking with Tommy Mello. In 2010, Tommy became the sole owner of a Phoenix-based garage door service with over $50,000 in debt. Today, A1 Garage is worth $50 million plus in the home service business with over 360 employees in 17 states. Tommy also has several other business interests, interests, including a book that he wrote and a top 50 podcast on Apple. Tommy, welcome to The Green Grind. We are certainly glad to have you with us today. Thank you guys. Looking forward to this. Yeah, but, absolutely. We are as well. Tommy, were those stats right? He, he, I said, I don't know. He, he said, I pulled them off, I don't know, somewhere. I said, I, I think it was on your website. I believe they're fairly close, but probably you're probably doing more than 50 million at this point, I would have said. Yeah, no, 700 employees. Uh, we're going to do well over 200 million this year. And um, yeah, that's awesome. We just partnered with private equity. So it's, it's a look. I'm super excited about where we're going. The, the next chapter is 10xing the business again. Awesome. I knew, I knew it was a big number. And, uh, you know, I, I saw Tommy out at uh, Mike Andy's had a deal out in uh, just outside of Seattle. And he spoke there and, and just talked a lot about uh, just everything he said made a lot of sense to me. Um, and, and I talked about some of the different things. But, man, it was about people and culture and growing a business. And so, you know, for our listeners, guys, this isn't about lawn care, but, um, I hope you get a lot out of what Tommy has to say. He, you know, he built an amazing company, and and man, it's it's still the same whether you got five guys and you're trying to get to ten, or you're trying to get to 750 employees, which is is remarkable. And so, um, yeah, Tommy, we appreciate you spending some time with us. I know you're a busy man with all kinds of different things going on, and and uh, we're ready to we're going to jump into this thing and uh, find out a little bit more about you and your company and and how you got that thing to this this monster you've got today. Tommy, can you, good. could you uh, just give us a little bit of background on you and, and kind of how you got your start so our listeners know a little bit about who you are? Yeah, so I grew up in Michigan, and what do you do when you're from the Midwest is you shovel snow and mow lawns when you're a kid. So uh, came out to Arizona when I was 16, finished high school, and started a landscaping company. And I used to focus on how could I be different than everybody else. So I used to do water conservation analysis for large companies. And I picked up mostly all commercial work. There was about 20 clients I still did. And, you know, I remember just going to Home Depot when I needed help with just going a little bit faster. Whoever can make it into the truck, that's those guys were the hardest workers. So, um, but I started A1 in 2007. Uh, I had a partner and in 2010 we went separate directions, but I am the epitome of Murphy's Law when it comes to every mistake in the book. And the one thing I will say is I fall down a lot, but I get back up. And um, failure is not something that I'm afraid of. I don't mind missing goals. I, I don't, I strive to be better than I was yesterday. And I recognize my weaknesses. And I think what really set me up for success is my mom and stepdad moved out here from Michigan in 2010. And I could trust them. And that's what I was looking for is trust. In 2014, I found a really amazing integrator. And I made him a COO. We were, I was paying him 50 grand a year. And he's like, dude, you used to just walk up to me every few weeks and pay me. There was really no rhyme or rhythm to it. He's like, you were just, it felt like the first seven, eight years of the business, I was still in the, still in the truck and I was working in the business. And then I found somebody that I could depend on to do payroll and HR and the things that I hated. And then I was able to dream again. And I started focusing on reading, podcasting, visiting successful HVAC shops. And success success leaves clues is what I figured out very quickly. And I kind of had a mind shift when COVID started of just, what can I do for them? How could I be a better leader? How could I lead from up front? And that, I hired a dream manager who focuses on helping each and every person that, that I get to call my coworkers focus on what their dreams and their goals are for their life and how important it is to integrate them. And we celebrate when people are leaving and retiring, but we don't really celebrate when we hire somebody, we should get their family involved and their, their husband or wife and their kids. And we should just do a better job in the beginning because that's when they're going to pick if it's a job or a career mm -hmm. and just think about what's in it for them. Like not only, yes, we PTO and, and, and all the good benefits and a new truck and, and give them the tools and training, 
but really what are their real goals? What are their dreams? Who do they want to spend time with? Do they want to go to Disney world? Do they want to take their grandma to Italy? Or do they want to have a house and three rental houses? And if we could discuss those things that they care about instead of what the company's goals are, we're going to be way more successful. I know that's a long winded story of where we're at today, but uh, I'm definitely ADHD, not organized, uh, not great at time management. So I've got people around me because I've hired for a lot of my weaknesses and now I enjoy Mondays again. I'm, I'm excited to be here and it doesn't feel like work to me. And I come in every day enjoying my life. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I say that a lot, man. If you, if you're praying for Fridays and hating Mondays, you got to do something different. And you know, my life was that way for a long time, man. I just, you know, you get kind of in a rut and, and so many people today work in jobs where they just, yeah, they're praying for Fridays, they're hating Mondays. Um, and I also appreciate what you said there. I just had a conversation with a guy, uh, over lunch today. And I just said, you know, you got to get surrounded with people that you got to know what you're good at and you got to get surround yourself with people where you're weak. I just, I just try to put people around me that fill those gaps. And, and I do, you know, I'm old school. So I've got, where are we today? Where do we want to be? And what, what obstacles are in the way? And then who do I need to get in place that can, you know, pick up that stuff? Cause I'm a lot like you. I'm, I'm a, I'm a pusher. I'm a driver, but I'll, I create fucking chaos everywhere. And if I'm not careful and I don't surround myself with great people, um, you know, it, 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 it's chaos. Right. And if I can get great people around me, like it sounds like you've done, you know, you can be the, you know, the visionary and then everybody else get the right people around you to, to rein it in. And then, then look what, you know, happens, you grow. Well, yeah, we started out. So, you know, my goal was always a hundred million in the, 2013 2014 and we surpassed that so i remember writing down a billion on my whiteboard in the top right and that's kind of an okr outcome and key result is a billion dollars it's a kpi mm -hmm. money's a great thing when you especially when you don't have it but i said okay i'm going to use real numbers to get to a billion and if an average tech does five hundred thousand, i need two thousand techs how am I going to build a training facility? Who's going to be my recruiters? What are my ride along forums? How do I get their tools, iPads, their vehicles ready, the gas cards, systematize the whole thing. And when, when I built the vision, no one really could comprehend a billion dollars of revenue until I put it in really, really easy numbers. Here's how many calls we need. Here's our booking rate. Here's our conversion rate. Here's our average ticket this is what it costs to acquire a customer. And when we really looked at it, everybody walked out of my office that we're in today and said, holy shit, this guy's serious. This is real. And now they all started to believe. And that's the biggest thing is mindset is believing and dreaming so big. A lot of people dream of 5 million. And I don't think they're dreaming big enough because, and having a plan is so important and the tough conversations of being a talent magnet. And I just, my dreams now are 10 billion. And that's just, I, I not to be condescending, but I've done pretty well, especially after this deal. I don't need to be here. I choose to be here and I want better for everybody. And that, you know, I'm not trying to get a plug here, but I wrote a new book that's coming out in March called Elevate, Build a Company Which Everybody Wins. And it's so important that our vendors win, the internal customers win, our customers win, our partnerships win. And from this Elevate mindset is where I just feel like it's just a fun place to be. It feels like a different type of air in here when you walk in. Absolutely. Backing up just a little bit, Tommy. So you start this company and I think, you know, out at the, when I saw you speak, I mean, it, it was just you in a van, right? I mean, or a couple vans. <clears throat> we had a beat up truck and an old van. <laughs> yeah. And then you started talking about even branding. And we talk a lot about that on our podcast and these guys, you know, whether you're just chucking a truck or you got one crew, two crews, and they just don't understand the value of creating a brand. And then, you know, what I love so much that you talk about is elevating your people. Cause man, with great people, the results, man, they take, they start to take care of themselves. Well, you got branded leads versus non-branded leads. When you get a branded lead and somebody calls and they search in Google, a one garage door service versus garage door repair, Detroit or Wisconsin or Milwaukee or, you know, Vegas. Um, those leads, number one, convert a hell of a lot better. They're definitely happy customers. They'll wait longer. They'll leave five-star reviews. And so the branding, uh, I'll give you a few pointers on branding. Number one is take a picture of your truck in black and white. And if it doesn't shout out what you do, you don't need to put, we mow lawns, we do sprinklers, we do. I used to put everything, springs, rollers, cables, bottom rubber. We do new doors. And I looked at my truck one day and I'm like, you can only pick up six words. So put what you do, hopefully in the title, your company name, 
you don't need to put Angie's List or the BBB and people people always tell me I don't know and I'm like look when I just put A1 Garage for a service with a good character couture on it and it was simple and you could read it and you knew what we did and it was a beautiful brand and I changed about four years ago it completely changed the dynamic I drive brand new vans they're clean they're slick they tell us what we do and they're a billboard on the road every day and when you pull up in that brand new truck you know you're going to get done right and you're going to spend more money because we're not discount garage doors. We, we, we respect who we are and every single internal customer we have here that they're going to get paid the best in the industry, but they're also going to be background checked, drug tested. They're also going to work weekends and nights uh, if they choose to. And it, I, I charge a premium price for a premium service and our brand says that. Right. Yeah, I get that too. I, you know, we don't even have our phone numbers on our trucks anymore. We just literally have our, our power P. I don't even know if our trucks say perfect cut anymore. They might some of them, but we branded so well that if you see a blue truck with the power P on the door and the two stripes, we used to have it mowing and irrigation and landscape tree surface. And we had all this shit on our trucks. Right. And nobody reads that. Um, and nobody's getting their, they're not driving by you on the highway, taking your phone number off your vehicle anymore. And I think Leroy, your trucks look way better now too. I think you've cleaned them up where it's just, your logo is just boom. It's just there. Yeah. We, well, we used to have the same type of stuff. You know, it said 14 different services that we offered and now it's just our logo, a clean tang line. And, and I believe our website's on, which probably doesn't even need to be there anymore at this point, but it's just, you know, it's just that logo and a, just a quick tagline and it gets the attention and that's all you really need, I believe. So I, I truly believe that that's a that's a great way to do that. So, Tommy, what when you when you started the Garage Door Company, did were you envisioning it being this big, and and was that your goal when you set out? I mean, just coming from, you know, a beat up truck and a in a beat up van, starting that. What what was your vision when you started the whole thing? I mean, I had a pretty grand vision of something big. I don't, I didn't define what the numbers would look like, but I remember I found an old old computer and just I was using my dad told me you should be able to do two percent of direct mail and i made the mistake of putting that into val pack into my equation and i had this huge goal but i would say that uh once i really started to understand the systems of business is when i sort of changed my mind on how big i could get and i just being around the guys every day in hvac doing 500 million to a billion dollars the guys that i'm in all the mass text with i'm in all their groups um, it just gave me, they said it can never be done in garage doors. And I'm, I'm a pretty competitive son of a bitch. So I was like, everybody that said I couldn't would be just that extra push to push harder every single year and make tough decisions. And now I'm like, I just feel like business has a whole different, I look at it as an equation now I mean, it's, it's not very complicated. If you focus on the core principles, some people over complicate things and the, the mindset of most business owners is if I don't do it myself, it won't get done right. Mm -hmm. And whereas you got to let people fail, but you got to have systems, fix the system. If the, if the operation is not going great, it's because the system's broken. And that's why I have a manual for every position. Everybody's on performance pay. Everybody gets to win. We all win together. If you're not winning, you know, we're going to talk one-on-one -on -one and we're going to figure out what's going on because is it a, um, is it a willpower issue or is it just, you just don't know. And I think that's where, if you got a will, I'm going to find a way you might not be the best at something, but I'm going to get you the training you need. And we hire people, not that are good technicians. We hire people with a big smile that could tell a great story that I want to hang out with. And we teach them the work. Whereas most people are trying to find lightning in a bottle from another company. Oh, this guy's great. Now in landscaping, you guys got a great thing going because it's repeat business. Hopefully it's on a subscription model which is amazing because you don't need as many clients and it's all about routing at that point. For me, it's all about demand services. When your garage door breaks, we got to get out there. Um, I'm not as good at understanding the numbers at, at a landscaping or, or, or a pool company on that reoccurring service model. But, um, but I think that if you train your guys right and you make them feel great and you integrate them properly and continue to train them, you, you actually find that you help retain them. Absolutely. And Absolutely. That's the goal. Well, I do. I like what you said there too. You know, you, you said you're in like groups of texts with different guys. And I just think people, a lot of people think too small. I mean, I, I want to hang out with people when I was way back in the beginning, I hung out with people that were doing way more revenue than me with way bigger companies than me. 
if you're hanging out with people, if you're hanging out with losers, I, I hate to tell you guys, but you're not going to get anywhere. You got to hang out with people that are moving and shaking, doing things that are big, helping you dream bigger, making you believe that you can do it. So you believe it yourself. And there's so many people just hanging out with the same people doing the same shit, getting the same results. And they just, they can't think big enough. And, um, you know, and it is a motivator. And, you know, I also like what you said. And I think I, you know, I, I'm sure I said that at Mike Andy's deal What I'll take great people with no experience every day of the week and we'll train them in our systems. And you, again, you got to have training. You got to have good systems in place. It does take longer to get them up to speed. But when you do that and you put the energy into those people with the great, with the right core values, work ethic, man, you just get better people. And it does, it might take six months longer to get them up to speed, but they're better. They'll stay with you. They respect your customers. They respect your company. And it just, I don't know. We, we've found that we get better people that way. And I don't know, Leroy, I'm, I think the same with you. I mean, we've talked about this numerous times, you know, guys are like, well, I need somebody with five years lawn care experience. And I'm like, why? Right. What, yeah. if he, what, if he's, what if he's got a shitty attitude and has been with four companies in five years? We were just actually talking about it in our, in our uh, leadership meeting today that, you know, we need to make sure we're hiring the correct people. And, and just as you said, Tommy, you know, we'll hire a guy with a smile and a great attitude over somebody that has seven years of experience any single day and, you know, comes in and kicks, kicks trash cans and, and throws shit through the shop just because those people, like you said, will stick around and, uh, it's just it's just flat out better for our culture. And it didn't used to be that way. It used to be, you know, we want somebody with experience so they can come in, hit the ground running day one, and it doesn't make any difference what their attitude is and stuff as long as they can get the work done. And what we found was, you know, those people that supervised the people below them, the people below them didn't want to stick around because they didn't want any part of that stuff. They, yeah. you know, they thought that's the way the entire organization was. And it just wasn't the case. It was just, you know, one bad piece of cancer in the entire thing. And it just, it just wasn't for us. So that's awesome. Tommy with, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, listen, if you, if you look at your circle and you don't get inspired on a daily basis, you don't have a circle, you have a cage. Yep. And it actually holds you down. Literally. You, you don't notice this and the people around you don't try to do this, but misery loves misery. And when you, when somebody's successful and they start growing outside of their comfort zone, people don't realize this, but it actually bothers them that they're successful. And a lot of people in this world, unfortunately, don't think about it, but they're holding other people down. I had two managers in different markets. One was in um, Kansas and the other one was in Texas. And they called each other three times a day to bitch about how bad things are and how they hate this and this other guy doesn't know what. Then I had two other managers in Detroit and um, Milwaukee. They talked every day about how great things were and what they were going to do to change things in a good way. And... Both those markets are doing 10 million. The other markets at the time were doing two. And it's just a different mindset. It's a mindset of abundance. And I'm telling you guys, if you take the average five people around you that you spend the most time with, divide them by five, you're going to be within 20% of their, their what they make. And by going to different circles, getting out of your comfort zone, pushing yourself. And even as an employee, you know, we talk a lot about businesses having a budget and a plan. Well, what if every single employee had a budget and a plan and you teach financial stability and how to save and the delayed gratification and consistency. People overestimate what they could do in one year and underestimate what they could do in five because we have short, short memories and we want things, instant gratification. That's what this world is now. And it's just hard work and discipline and consistency that makes up a great business. Yeah. How often, and do, it's, I, it's a, how often do I say consistency? People yeah. always want to know that they always want, you know, they want the secret sauce, you know, and it's, and I like what they want to get in shape in a week. They want to get rich in a month. You know, they want to be a better father, a better husband. And it's like, dude, people are like, what's the secret? Consistency. you got to do the work for a long time. And you got to stay consistent. you got to do it when you don't want to do it. you got to work when people, other people are dicking around. You've got to be consistent. I was, um, I was just at a thing. Uh, it was a big, it was actually a smaller event of all the who's who of HVAC and plumbing. And there were six guys on this board. It was like the OGs. All these guys are 500 million plus revenue. And one of the guys, Jimmy Hiller go, goes, because they were talking about what gets you up and do you have any regrets? And he's like, look, he's like, we all want more time with family, but I took my family time very seriously for a couple hours a night, turned off my cell phone. But if you don't think I busted my balls for 30 years, every day, every weekend, every night, every holiday, I couldn't be with the kids all the time because if I was with the kids, I wouldn't have a roof over their head. So I made a decision that I'm going to work my ass up for the generations to come. Cause 
a lot of people have regrets. Hey, I wish I would have spent more time with family. But then again, now I'm sure both of you are, are doing great and you're able to do the things you want when you want with who you want. I want that not only for me, but for each and every person that works here is freedom. And they didn't teach how to balance a checkbook in high school for some reason. They didn't teach financial literacy. And so we got everybody subscribed to Dave Ramsey. I don't necessarily agree with Dave Ramsey when it comes to the ability to use um, other people's money. But ultimately, uh, we're trying to teach people how to own homes and go on their dream vacations. And what that means is you can't buy that Harley this week when you had a great paycheck. Right. Right? Because <laughs> compound interest could be the worst thing or the best thing, depending on the investment. Yeah, I do like that you said that, you know, one of the things that we do at Perfect Cut is, you know, we teach people, um, again, financial responsibility, um, working out, we've paid people to quit smoking. Um, we want them to be healthy. We want them to be financially stable. We want them to understand what a 401k means. Like, well, I can't afford it. Let us show you, let us show you what just putting 4% in and with what with the match, let's show you what it looks like in 10, 15, 20 years. Whether you stay with us or not, we always say this, we want you to leave better than when you started, and hopefully you'll stay with us, right? And you mentioned careers versus jobs. We talk about that all the time. We're trying to hire people and build careers, and and but we're teaching them how to live a better life, how to be healthy, how to be better fathers, friends, husbands, wives, whatever it may be, um, trying to just elevate them from every level and make them better people. And, and you know, you, as you mentioned, you know, you have a dream. I think you call it a dream, dream maker. What do you call that person? Dream manager. Dream yep. manager. I love, we need to get a dream. I need a dream manager. I want well, to be a, a dream book. manager. <laughs> and I put her through a certification. It's 10 grand and there's actually a book and it explains, I just want to explain the concept of the book. This guy, he had a, um, a cleaning business. Basically they clean houses and they clean uh, commercial cleaning like buildings. And it was mostly Hispanic and it actually ends up to be a fictional story, but it felt real when you read the book. And he's looking at his turnover rate and he, he's turning over employees. The average was like 58 days. And so the manager said, can I try something? Can I send out a, uh, a survey to find out what, what's most important to people. And he thought it was the pay. That's what everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. And it turns out mm -hmm. that it, it was a Hispanic cleaning company for the most part in the book. And the most important thing to them was they couldn't get a ride to work. So they figured out a way of a carpool system. And all of a sudden, that jumped from 58 days to six months. And then he said, what is, what's the next survey we're going to do? So they sent out another survey and everybody there wanted to learn English, like as a, like very good English. So they brought on people to teach English for not only the employees, but the families. And what they started doing is listening to what the people wanted. And it wasn't always about money because there's a fact, very little people after $70,000, and this is different for some, but it makes very little effect. And after 220,000, it virtually means nothing as far as careers, if you're not happy. So they started listening and then they built this whole, this whole uh, certificate uh, called the dream manager. And their whole job is just to help people. My dream manager, what's that, that, that show called billions where they have that psychologist that kind of helps people get in the right mindset. That's her job. Kelly's job is help you stay on pace and build the dreams you want. And it's important that when I'm talking to people, my coworkers, and I get to ask them, you told me this is what you wanted for you and your family. And I'm giving you a path to get there. So these hard conversations become a lot easier when you make it about them and what they actually told you. Now, maybe what they said was not perfectly their dream. Maybe it's what they thought their dream should be. So we got to really get down to the root of what their goals are. But I need somebody that wants more. If you're just content, you're probably not going to do well here at A1 Garage Door Service. If you want more for your life, if you want a, an, an abundance and freedom to do what you want when you want with who you want and enjoy every minute, then this is the right place to come work. Yeah. You know, we talk about employer culture a lot and it's been, it's come up a whole lot more here in the past year, I would say, and especially after COVID with the, you know, with the employee problems that everybody has and those kinds of things. And, and we both talked at length about how, you know, our culture is currently changing and you guys had that same thing. Was there ever a point, Tommy, when you're in your business at, at the garage door company where you came along and like, our culture sucks, we've got to change this. And, and what did you start to do to implement that, to change those things? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Uh, yeah, there was a time in probably 2011 when I walked into work and there were three people taking a cigarette break and my mom had three phone calls on the line. And <laughs> what a shit show. <laughs> I, I was like thinking to myself, I don't even want these people. They don't care. 
And then I realized I was the problem. I was not a good leader. I was not leading from up front. And I didn't take complete ownership. And I needed to be, when bad stuff happened, to own up to it, look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. Instead of blaming other people for my problems, that I wasn't a great trainer, I didn't listen great enough, I didn't communicate. And I don't know, 2017, I read a book. I think it was 2017. It's called The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. And in the book, he explains, he wrote down 100 things what the perfect woman would be, the way she smelt, the motherly features, everything, the perfect woman. And when I read that book, I remember sitting in my old office and writing down 20 things I would need to become to be, get the people I deserve. Because he wrote down the perfect woman, then he wrote down, he's like, I can't even get this chick. This chick is like way out of my league. So he wrote down 100 things he would need to become. Mm -hmm. So after I read what he would have to become, I said, I I didn't think of it in a relationship. I said, who would I have to become as a leader, a mentor, a founder, to get the people that I want to be around, to attract the right talent, to actually enjoy my life more? instead of feeling like I'm going into work and to be a firefighter. So I wrote down, I'd be a better communicator. I'd be a leader. I'd, I'd think more about the people instead of just the company. And I wrote down these things and I really focused on becoming that leader that people want to be around, that I'm a good listener, that I want people to succeed. And I don't get mad when somebody makes 300 grand. I, I rejoice and I, I jump up in the air and I clap and I say, you deserve every bit of this. So it's not a it's not a bad thing to make a lot of money. And I don't get upset and ever say, I can't believe that guy made 300 grand. I didn't even make that. It's like I work really hard on performance pay. I don't like to call it commission because we look at a lot of other things and just what's your revenue you brought in. We look at the, everybody's got a scorecard here. Mm-hmm. And my scorecard is the financial statements. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I think it's great. You know, when you say I was the problem, and and I look at that all the time now is when we when we fail, something goes wrong. What did we do inside our office? What did our management team not do? What did we not perform to make these people fail? And, you know, it's so hard for people to look at their reality in their organization and look at themselves of, of what's failing rather than blaming it on somebody else. And I think that's an awesome answer. Yeah, I wrote it down. I am the problem. And I had it right here, too. I, wrote, quotes. I wrote it down. And, and, and that's exactly what we, you know, Everybody, nobody wants to work. Everybody's lazy. All this, all this bullshit that's going on, and that's not true. Great companies find great people. They figure out the way to do that. And we're just like you. When we lose somebody, we always go back and look at it and say, "Where did we fail? Did we hire the wrong person? Were they in the wrong seat? Was the roles and responsibilities not clear? Were they not trained?" I mean, we always go back and look at what we could have done different or better. Um, to lead them. And instead of saying, well, they're just a piece of shit. They're just lazy. They never wanted to work here in the first place. Um, where, what do I need to do different as a leader or our team to get the best talent and keep the best talent? And it's really about figuring out what motivates people. And there's a lot of great personality profiles out there, but understanding whether it's a five love languages of the business or the color code. Uh, I met this guy at that seminar. His name's Howard Bihar, and he took them from four Starbucks from 40 stores to 15,000 stores. He ended up retiring when they were 15 billion. Now they're 32 billion. And the book's titled, It's Not the Coffee. It's not about the coffee. I haven't read it yet, but he was a speaker and he said, listen, my job was constantly just telling the story and telling them what we're going for. And, and they're part of something bigger than just a landscaping company. They're part of something more. They're doing something. We're involved in the community. We're changing lives. And it's not about the garage doors. I can tell you guys that. Right. I, I, you throw me into any industry, I can tell you this. It's about the people. It's about changing lives. It's about our clients. It's about everything. And that's why I wrote the book Elevate. But, man, I went up and I, I talked for 20 minutes in front. And he happened to be in the stage. And he goes, that was the best speech I ever heard because it was all about my internal customers. And it was about giving a shit. And it's about going up above and beyond and being a mentor. And I think that we, you know, did you start business for the right reasons? And I didn't know that I was going to change a lot of lives, but what I did know is I was going to be the best version of myself. And there were times that I got upset. There were times where I was down on people, but I put myself in a position now that I don't do any firing at all. I give the trophies, I kiss the babies, I shake the hands, and I put myself in a position that I'm the great cop. I can't be a bad guy. I don't have it. it, it I don't even get anxiety or stress anymore because I, I've removed myself from everything negative. There's still shit that happens. My guy got in a really bad car accident. He's perfectly okay, and so is the other person. But shit happens. It was a dual ca- dual camera system in every vehicle. It wasn't our fault. And everybody said, okay. But these are the things 
I, I put myself in this position and it wasn't easy because I had to recognize my weaknesses and hire for them. And that's the best thing you could do is build an org chart. And a lot of us are everything in the company. It's circle the things you hate the most, build a really nice job description that doesn't sound like a, a prison sentence. You must be only accountable, <laughs> oh, only seven days a week. It must be, must be, must be. It's like, who would want to work for that asshole? Right. I'm like, this is, I don't even tell them it's a garage door company until the end. I'm like, this is a fun atmosphere. You get to grow. We're, we're looking for to move up, up from within. We, we do this as a team. 83% of people say they stay at a company because they built best friends outside of work. So what are you doing outside of work for your people? Are you having volleyball competition? Or... Re is moving into a uh, event planning where we're going to have every quarter, the families all get together and have fun. And it could be as cheap as Frisbee golf or volleyball or a softball tournament. They don't cost any money. People say, I just don't have the money to do this stuff. I'm like, dude, that's a cop out. Look in the mirror. That's you making excuses again of why you're always going to be just okay, why you're just going to get by. One of the things I always tell people, and this is probably the most important lesson in business, is if I ask you how much you made last year and you say 200 grand, and then I say, what did the company make? And you say, well, I just told you we made 200 grand. You better pay yourself six figures and the company still better bring 15% or more. Or that's not a business. That's a job. And your mm -hmm. company should make a healthy profit on top of paying yourself great. Or it's never worth anything except for the phone number. Yeah, we talk about that all the time. You know, do you have a business or do you have a job? And, and there's a huge difference in those two as far as, like you just said, paying yourself and not paying yourself. And, and I, I can speak from experience. You know, there was a lot of times when, when you – you would ask me that question. I would have said, we made $85,000 last year. You know, that was the pay. That was the business. That was everything at once. And when you start drawing a salary, you know, your business completely changes because you're like, oh, you know, now we have this extra money and, you know, this is my salary. And it just com it completely changes your cash flow in your business once you're taking that salary out. Right. Well, and I just, you know, for our listeners, guys, you know, and, and Tommy's got a big company, but it's not, a, it wasn't an accident. You know, that's the deal. People are like, well, it's different for you guys. You know, Perfect Cut has this many people or Brilliant Borders has this many people or A1 Garage Wars. It, yeah, but we, we didn't. I had two people. Then I had four people. Then we had six. It starts from the bottom when you build that culture. And I love when you spoke at the other deal. You were talking all about people. How do I take care of my people, elevate my people, pay them a crazy good, you know, compensation that's based on performance and love them. I mean, we love on our people today more than we ever have. And we get more out of them. And I just, I, I hate this shit going on right now where nobody wants to work. Everybody's lazy. You know, and I talked about it, that deal is pay is like, if you look at any, anything, just Google it. Pay is like fifth or sixth. And sometimes it's not even in the top 10 of why people work where they work. And, and you know, they want to make an impact. They want to be respected. They want to work where their friends work. They want to be treated well. I mean, there's so many things and everybody just thinks it's about compensation. You do have to pay them well. And you hopefully have a system in place that, that's profitable. So you can pay your people exceptionally well. So they stay, but that's not the number one reason people, I mean, and if people are leaving for a dollar an hour more or five bucks an hour more, whatever that number is, then you didn't do the right things in the first place. Yeah. That, that, that people don't understand it costs somewhere in the range of 40 to 60% of that person's salary for the year when they leave. So get somebody recruited and retrained and brought up to speed. You know, you look at Phil Jackson and his best years, I think it was 87 and 91. He had, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman. He had the dream team. And when I look, I never call myself a manager. I, I like to call myself a coach. Is Phil Jackson worked with his top people. And I think in business, sometimes we tend to go to the bottom 20% and really work on them instead of making the best better. And I always say better your best. Beat yesterday. I don't, we take the mean of everybody and that's what we use is the mean. And if, if we've got outliers, we take the median. And we really came up with a system that we're bringing up the top, but we always, I, I work with the top 20 guys on a daily basis and I dare them to become better because as the, the ceiling goes up, everybody, it pulls everything up too. It's crazy how that works is, you know, the guy that ran the four minute mi mile, it took like a hundred years within like a week, 20 other people ran it. It just says it's possible. They got seeing is believing. And when you're able to take the best and make them better and work together better, 
you're able to raise the standard and it's, it, it really helps everybody. Absolutely. I love that. And, you know, I was reading this weekend about a, a deal and it, it talks about how, you know, most companies take their best people and put them on their, their biggest problems that they have. Whereas this book talks about, you know, take your best people and put them on your biggest opportunities and watch how things rise for you. And just as you said, you know, you take your best people and you continue to elevate them, watch how everybody rises. And those people at the bottom will either elevate or they'll get off the bus. One of the two. Absolutely. What, uh, okay, where are we at here with this? Well, thing? you know, I was thinking this podcast is going to be about, I didn't know what it was going to be about, but now as I look behind you, though, Tommy, I see about a hundred books. I was just going to mention that. You know, and, and guys, you know, listening, we talk about this, man, read, listen to podcasts. You know, if you're sitting on a mower all day, I don't understand why you're listening to Motley Crue. I mean, maybe you like Motley Crue, I do too, but whatever, rap, I don't care what, why are you not, you know, Tommy, you've mentioned five, 10 books already. Man, there's so much information out there for all of us to be better leaders, better coaches, better husbands, fathers, you name it. And guys are just not taking it up. And I think a lot of them are just, I hear this a lot. Well, you know, that works for you. My life's different. You know, that it's, that's bullshit. That's a cop out. It's available to all of us. There's, there's books, you know, we had Matt Bowen, my business partner on Matt probably reads, what do you say? Two, book, two books a month Something or two like books that. a week. Yeah. I mean, he's constantly trying to educate himself so he can be a better listener, a better learner, a better mentor man, the information's out there. And, and we continue to, we all continue to hone our leadership skills. I, I'm not the same leader I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And if you want to do great things, man, you got to get around great people. You got to, you got to get good mentors in your life. You got to read books. You got to listen. And, you know, Tommy, that's all he's been talking about is people, right? How do, how do you elevate? You know, how do you lead? Well, your customers, think about this. I, I interview my top two guys every week in a different, whether that's conversion rate, average ticket turnovers, there's different KPIs we look at. And I get to learn from them and I get to question them. So we do about 10 minutes before then we do a Zoom. So every one of my markets watch this video. There's two meetings a day on top of that. And then Thursday's an hour and a half. And I interview them and, and I get to study the winners and I don't take time studying the losers. And I'm not, no one's a loser of the company, but the losers in KPIs. So what I do is I say, dude, how did you do that this past month? And like last week, this guy goes, you know, when I was retraining in Phoenix, one of the instructors came up to me and, and mentioned, you don't, you don't look like you look like a stiff board. You don't look like you're having fun. Smile more, ask more questions, enjoy the company of the people. And so, and then another guy said, I started taking 45 minutes to get to know the customer and I bring them coffee. This was in a, a Reno, Reno, Nevada technician. And he goes, I get to know the client for the first hour and ask a lot of questions. And we always give options because if we're not giving options, we're giving ultimatums. And mm -hmm. one of the best things I could ever tell you in any home service company is if you're not giving options and you should have higher options and you should have lower options. And I always tell people the garage door is 40% of your curb appeal. It's the smile of your home. Remodel Magazine said garage doors are the number one ROI in your home, but better than your kitchens or bathrooms. And I just changed the narrative and the best option I think for them. And it might not be the top one. I'd call it Corey. What's your kid's name? Levi. So I'd say this is Corey. You mentioned that your, your son wakes up every day you leave for work because of the garage door. This is the keep Levi sleeping when you leave option. And we talk about the words that work. We talk about never say the most expensive. We call it top of the line. Never say the cheapest. We say the most economical. We never say, do you want financing? We say, did you want to use your money or our money today? You want to see what pr promotions we have? And we practice this over and over. Wow. We don't believe that there's a time for training and then it's over. Because I play two a days in football where we practice 10 days to play one game. Why in business do we say, do this ride along for a month and not, you're on your own forever? Retrain, 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 orient right, celebrate when people start and watch what happens. Nice. That's, yeah. that's good. So I'm glad I put those expensive garage doors. I put, I put new doors on my house this year and it took like a year to get them. They're out of California. They're badass. So I put these new badass garage doors. They were crazy expensive, but I didn't know they were the smile of my house, but they do look good. They are awesome. <laughs> and it's funny you mentioned that though, you know, in my neighborhood, we have a, a mix of houses and you, you can, the garage door makes the entire front of the house, whether it's got I thought glass. it was landscape. I no, thought the landscape it, made the house. Well, it does in my neighborhood. But, but I mean, really, if you got glass in it, it looks completely different. If it's painted versus just a shitty old, you know, door that's that's metal and white, it, it's just a world of difference in the thing. And yeah. I, I absolutely but love I, that. But I like so. how you mentioned, yeah. I mean, again, giving people options. And, again, we don't, you know, we've talked about this when we did high-end residential landscape. And 
we don't, you know, you have to ask the right questions and we don't decide for the customer. I, I've had people, you remember we did when we started doing high-end lighting and they, no one's going to spend 10000 on holiday lighting. I'm like, says who? Who says who? Well, we sold a shitload of lighting. Like you don't get to decide what the customer's budget because 10000 might seem crazy to you. On their two and a half, three million dollar house, they're like, oh, okay. I was thinking it was going to be twenty five. Yeah, and we well, we've started doing that with our lighting. Is you know, we have we have this option, and we have this other option. You know, this other option is is a little bit more expensive, but you're going to get you know lifetime warranty on the hey, bulbs. Top you of get the line. lifetime this. Yeah, top top of the line. Now after we've learned <laughs> something today, and kind of the same thing with our pavers. You know, we have the better and the best. Now we have the the inexpensive and the and the, the top of the line. You know, but but we we give them the economical. option economical right. economical Almost economical. But but it's not words matter. They do, and I'm going to play this thing again and get these get these words correct. But it's amazing when you give them a couple of different options. How many people will take that better option and pay you just a little bit more, and it's just more profitability that you're making. And had we never given them that option, we may not have got the work to begin with because it may not have been what they were looking for because we may have priced it with the least economical. Yeah. So you don't get to make that decision for the customer. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So I, I hand this book to every one of the new guys that starts with me. It's called Go for No. And everybody has to read it. It's a short, short, easy book. Everybody that's listening should read that book. And one of the things I was going to say is there's three type of buying personas when it comes to financing. And there's low interest, no interest, or low payment. And everybody fits into one of those. I, if you guys could get, and you, I made it easy for you to have no interest on a perfect, I don't know, couch or, or TV, and you said it was simple, it's automatically going to withdraw, I don't pay any interest, you would do it if it was simple. And another tip for some of the technicians out there is when you're giving a quote, never mention the word hundreds or thousands. So if it's 1,386, it's 1,386. And look directly in the customer's eyes and don't say a damn word. And you just if you say ten thousand eight hundred and twenty six dollars and thirty two cents, it just say it, you just round up or down and you just say the numbers, and it's confidence. It's being able to story tell, and I take people down a pain funnel. This is Sandler training, and the thing I used to ask every single house: Do you find it hard to communicate with your landscaper? Are they showing up at inconvenient times? What is the things you hate? And every time you could take them down that pain funnel and tell them that you're going to solve their problems, not yours, then you're successful. That, one of my favorite quotes is if I had six hours to chop down a tree, I spent the first four hours sharpening the blade. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln said that. And we don't spend enough time sharpening w with our coworkers. We need to spend more time sharpening the blade. And efficiency is great. And I think landscapers look at efficiency a lot, but I look at how much are we investing into that relationship? which yeah, is a client. Absolutely. And so, solution-based. I mean, that's exactly what we do is we find out when we're meeting with the client, we want to know how do we become, how do we solve their problem? How do we make their life easier? We're a solution-based company and we ask questions and we listen um, and then we solve their problems. And again, that's, that's where it's at. When you guys are trying to get clients, you know, you got to ask the right questions and then you got to shut up and listen, you know, and you know, that's where it's at. You've got to, Tell your story, but you've got to solve their problem. People want their problem solved. They want ease. And they want to work with people they trust. They, you know, and so you've got to spend the time. And it sounds like your people spend a lot of time, you know, creating relationships, which, again, that's how you get the repeat business. And then they tell their friends, man, I use so-and-so landscaper. I want garage doors or whoever, and they're the best. And then it just the, that, and it snowballs. You know, there, there's really only three ways to make money other than cutting costs. It's get more customers, which is the easy one. The second way is to charge your customers more money. And the third one is to keep them coming more frequently. And I'm a big fan of all of those. So I saw a service agreement and we just were bringing in overhead storage, which raises the average ticket. Getting new customers seems to be the easy thing that everybody says is how do I get more leads? How do I get more leads? And I'm like, well, let's look at your conversion rate. Let's look at your booking rate. Let's make sure your KPIs deserve more clients because if you're not taking advantage of the ones you currently have, it costs 10x to get a new client and to keep it existing one. And I find a lot of businesses, they got their back door open. They're so focused on their front door. They're losing clients out the back door. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge mistake. And it, it, there's a guy, uh, the ultimate sales machine by Chet Holmes. He explains this guy had this carpet cleaning business. And Chet walked into his office and said, what's the average time you go back to the office or home to clean the carpets? And he said, 18 months. 
So they did a case study that proved that the workplace is a healthier environment when there's carpet because it actually holds it, it sucks in a lot of those diseases and air uh, pollution and whatnot uh, in the office space. But after six months, it spreads them. So he was able to take the client that used them every 18 months and proved that you have a healthier, more productive workplace. People stay healthier. So he was able to triple his revenue by just changing the frequency. These little things. And by reading books, like you said, readers are leaders. And these little things, success leaves clues everywhere. All you got to do is look for them. And I try to be the dumbest guy in the room everywhere I go. And the reason I was talking at the landscaping event, I have a guy sending me wine. He said he learned more there. Uh, I've had a lot of close relationships that manifested from that. I mean, you guys are here right now. And I'm all, all about giving back because I, I've already done what I needed to do. I'm still going to continue to 10 exit. But ultimately, I'm at a landscaping summit and all the things that came out of that, people don't even understand why I was at a landscaping summit. I'm a garage door guy. And that's why I've learned a lot. I was listening to you, Corey, and there's so many things that were given. And that's why I get out of my comfort zone every day. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I was thinking here, here's a graduate guy talking at a landscape seminar, but I loved it. I mean, I like everything you said. I'm like, yep. I was just nodding my head, you know, it was, well, leadership's leadership, I believe, you know, along, it doesn't matter if you're in garage doors, landscaping, or, or selling cars, you know, leadership is leadership. And if you can get your, your, your people to elevate and continue to raise the bar on those things, you're, you're going to continue to do better, you know, year after year after year, obviously. And, and it, it just, it, it's fascinating to me how large companies don't get there, you know, like we talked about by mistake, you know, they invest in their people. And that's one thing that I've noticed with everybody that we talk to that has these larger companies, you know, that I would say, north of, of two to $3 million, they all invest back in their people and they all invest in training and you just, you just don't get there by mistake. And I think everybody kind of gets to that point of a million dollars or whatever it is in revenue. And they realize we've got a shit show on our hands. You know, we've got people flying out the door. We've got customers going out the back door. You know, we've got, we throw them in a truck with a t-shirt and off they go. And, and, you know, our worst employees training them, you know, and, and you have to get those systems down and you have to get that, those employee values in place. And you have to, you have to take care of those employees if you if you're going to continue to grow your business. I mean, I'm double downing on, I have a data integrity team. And basically what they do is we built an API from our CRM, which is a customer relationship management system that puts every picture onto a website that they could scan it quickly to make sure we didn't miss a piece. And then that's part of their scorecard to make sure that they took the pictures of the door with the scale to make sure it's perfectly balanced. We probably take 30 pictures and a video on every job we go to. And so now I'm doing one-on-ones with the data integrity. I'm building out a team of VAs in um, Armenia that literally every one-on-one meeting, they've got uh, a scorecard that they grade it and they're listening to the one-on-ones. I think a system has checks and balances and is almost foolproof to make sure we cover what we needed to. And there's a recipe and a formula for each person and they're never the same. So understanding simplicity, but having checks and balances is so key. So scalability goes through the through the roof when you got systems in place for checks and balances and a lot of people say why why didn't you do what you were told to do on the day one but did you build a manual and read it out loud with the person and have them initial each thing and repeat it back to you because then if not shame on you you say you knew that you weren't allowed to get a tattoo on your face <laughs> because of you know relationships with clients and they didn't know because there's no systems there's no I read the seven power contract contractor and hired Al Levy, paid him $300,000 and got manuals for every position. Not only did I put in manuals, I put in checklists. I put in all kinds of details and then I built systems around it to make sure it was being done. I remember when I first got on service site and guys were taking a picture of the sticker. And then I realized after I looked at 10 jobs that four of the pictures were the same. So I called service site and it said, no longer are you able to upload from the gallery. It's got to be a fresh picture. So they changed the software to find out all the holes. And if anybody could beat a pay structure, it's me. So I figured out how to beat it. And then I say, there's a hole here. And now, I mean, we still find out there's holes here and there, but overall our system's scalable and it's a system. And people say, what's more important, the system or the people or the product? And I say, the system is what gets the people, the ride along forms, the things we do. The system in which we pick people is the most important. Of course, people matter. And I one of the things I learned a long time ago too is I don't build a box around the person. I fit this perfect box, which is part of the assembly line. 
and the person fits into that box because a lot of times people build roles around people and then they realize if without this person he becomes invaluable and if that person leaves see i think i got the best multiple pretty much in home service because if i left the company would still grow because that's what a good business does they make it about roles and their systems in place and i can't emphasize that enough yeah definitely i like what you said there because we talk about that you know we say you know we got to get everybody on the same page i'm like well where's that page at you know, where do we find that page? You know, we talk, you know, I don't, I, they should have known. Why would they, they should have known? That's common sense. To who? You know, and you've got to build systems in place. And and that was the same when we sold Perfect Cut to a national company. It was the highest multiple they ever paid because we, first off, it ran without us. Um, we have great systems in place. It just, it, we have the systems in place. We built a brand of value. It's profitable. We have training. You have to have all those things in place. And you know, and if this episode, guys, is maybe above a lot of your heads, man, I hope you're getting a ton of information. I'm like, like I, I'm, well, I'm learning a lot just because, I mean, I love what you're saying. And I get these guys don't, you know, some of these guys listening have one or two employees and they're trying to get to 500,000 or a million or two million or five million or whatever that number is. But man, it's all relatable to starting with building great systems, taking care of your people, building a culture and company that they want to work for, taking care of them in work and outside of work. Um, you know, we do a lot of events at work, pancake breakfasts. We bring in pizza sometimes. We take small groups bowling. You you name it. We have tons of company functions, um, and we think it matters. And I don't know. It's working for us. We we're, Our retainage is the best it's ever been. We continue to grow. Why everybody else says they can't get people, we're like, shit, we're full. Leroy, you're full. No, right. we're not full anymore. We lost one last week. Well, went, to, went to work at the oil fields in North but, Dakota. But still, <laughs> you're, you know, but everybody else we talk to, I should say everybody, a lot of people we talk to, you know, it's the same bullshit. I can't find people. Nobody wants to work. And it's like, no, that's not true. It's, it's, it's. Nobody too- wants to work for you. Yeah, that's it. Look at you, what are you offering? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, here, here's the deal. I got a line of people all the time. And the one thing I'll tell the small business owners, because I came from, come from the same cloth. I know the story is I find that the blind leading the blind, it's literally, they don't know their numbers. I know my conversion rate, my average ticket, my cost per acquisition and my booking rate down to a science. I know my abandonment rate. I know it's 1.8% today. These KPIs now, I don't want to make life difficult, but there's four KPIs you need to pay attention to. Average ticket conversion rate, booking rate, and how much it costs to acquire a client. And if you know those and you know what you need to work on, you've got a mission and a purpose each day. So many people, got they've got a minute managers. They go walk in and there's a pile of shit for them to do. They're not focusing on the right things. And one of the other things I wrote down is they don't own their schedule. Yeah. Like getting a personal assistant or executive assistant, having somebody where you're not going through email and wasting your whole day just trying to figure out what to do next. You know exactly where your time, effort, and energy is going each and every day. And when you know your numbers, you know what's broken or you know what you could improve on the most. And when you have that, it's a compass that tells you what you should be doing where most people are like, I don't know, you know, there's so many things going on. I don't know where to focus. Well, double down on training and recruiting and making everybody, you know, your turnover rate. And then after that, KPIs tell me where I should be focusing. I mean, it's very simple what I need to be doing this whole week. And right. most people are like, man, how does he know down every day what he should be doing? And my schedule is like my lifeblood. I live, die and breathe by that. I was prepared for this. It was on my schedule. I knew it was coming up. Bree was setting up the computer before we got started. I was in another meeting. I ended that meeting because my calendar told me to. Right. And that's so, it's discipline and it's hard to do, but I'm not good at it. That's why I have somebody better than me. Right. And it was an investment to hire an executive assistant. And some of people, uh, look, it's the hardest thing in the world to work with your significant other. Um, I, I suggest trying to build some separation there as quick as possible. But my man, working, my mom worked for me, and this is one of the stories I told Corey, is when she'd answer the phone, she'd go, thank you for calling anyone garage for a service. My name's Gina. How may I assist you today? <laughs> oh, honey, I'm so sorry to hear that. And when I showed up to these houses, they were gravy. It was like, you're such a great company. You, who's that lady? And I'd say, you know, that's one of our best people, but I would never say mom and son. But ultimately, I'll tell you what, it's these little things, listening to each call, looking for empathy, but making a system around that instead of saying, I hired really great people. No, I've got checks and balances to make them be the best they could be. 
Yeah. I I love that you said that about your mom because it's my wife runs our front office and she's kind of the same way, you know, Oh, you know, she's, she's just caring and she's an empath and it's just the way that she is. And everybody loves talking to her on the phone, but you know, we, we separate our time and do those types of things. I know Corey works with his wife as well too, but man, there's, there's nobody having somebody that, that you work for like that, that'll care more about your organization, I think, than your mom or your, your wife or or whoever that person happens to be. But then Um, you got to replicate that. You know, every time we used to do a lot of residential services, man, we, we just spent a lot of time on, man, we have to be amazing on the phone. Well, and where I was going with that is we just hired that new marketing company and they're now starting, we have these other phone numbers and they're recording calls. And we, we were listening to them a couple of them last week. Ooh, man, we have some work to do. And, and it's amazing when you start recording some of that stuff and listening back to what your team's doing. It's like, holy shit, how are we even converting any of this stuff? on? Yeah. Some, and it's not that bad, but, you know, it just makes it look like, you know, when we're talking with somebody like Tommy or somebody like Matt Bullman or, you know, these larger companies, the smaller guys, I'm like, man, we have so much more work to do to get to that next level and continue to, to raise that bar. It just, it seems like a ton of work, but man, if you put the effort in, it's going to be worth it. Cause I remember when we were at, you know, 500,000, like how do we get to a million? You know, then you go flying past a million. Then how do you get to two? Then how do you get to three and just continuing to work on those things? And it's all about the people and not necessarily just the people, the right people. Right. Exactly. Well, here's the thing. Listen, look, there's a company called call cap that they have this thing called call insurance that they'll listen to each call and grade it. It's like a buck a call or a buck 20. Uh And people are like, man, I get 50 calls, a hundred calls a week. That's an extra man. That gets expensive. And I'm like, you don't have any checks and balances just because you walked in one day and listened to some calls. So I would, if I were you, Leroy, I, I would get a whiteboard and I come up with a solution that I won't have to listen to another call. I built a system in place that's not going to last a week or a month or a year. It's going to last forever. And it's, it's a unbiased third party and I'm setting mine up in Arminia and I've got, I've already got a system that we use to listen to each call, but we only listen to one tenth of the calls. That's not good enough for me now. I need to listen to every single one. So I'm setting up a system instead of having one tenth of them now that are all, and then the best advice I could give, and I just learned about this recently, is instead of having a form fill or anything, have a drop down menu of compliance. That way you could aggregate the results and dig into it deeper to know where you should be spending your time. So when that third party is listening to it, it's very simple. I, I created software in 2012 and it was a bunch of e- it was a bunch of people from other countries. And I went to log into the software and there was no forgot password. And I said, what the hell's wrong with you guys? Like, I didn't know the right password. They said, well, you didn't ask for the forgot password. And <laughs> by dealing with people in other countries, you start to realize how simplistic, keep it simple, Simon, things need to be. Right. The system needs to be a 10th grade B student could figure it out in one minute. And if you can make it that simple, it, it is, I learned this, uh, one of the, this company that's 220 million in, in town. And uh, one of the owners got up and spoke at this event and he goes, here's what we learned was simple. The technician just says, most of, most of people replace their HVAC after 10 years. Is there a reason that you haven't done this yet? That's simple. Each technician could repeat that at every job. Mm-hmm. And if you make it complex, complexity is what stalls businesses and makes it tough to grow. Yeah, definitely, man. A lot, a lot of information. A lot here. of information here. So, so you know, Leroy, you got You got to get your shit together. Yeah, you're telling me. I I was talking <laughs> to my wife about that last night. I'm like, we're a disaster, you know, and 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 we're not. But it's like it just makes you realize that you know, to where we where we are versus where we want to be are two completely different yeah. things, and we have to look at that at a reality of that's not where we want to be, and what you know, what do we have to put in place to get there? And it's it seems daunting, it, but we you know, if we do it one step at a time, we will get one there. thing so, at a time. Yeah, yep. exactly. One thing at a time. I've got 6,200 call tracking numbers. I know every single lead source, how good it's performing. And I've got a bar chart that I'm able to see every single market and what we need to work on for marketing. I love marketing and sales and I love training and, 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 and positive feedback. And I look at some people and I'm like, you've got one phone number for all of your marketing. You don't know what your pay-per-click is doing versus your LSA versus right. your GMB versus your stickers versus your Val pack. I'm like, how do you, so you're doing what I call spray. Uh, spray and pray. Mm-hmm. You're just, we're doing this and a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And it's been working so far. Yeah. And guess what? What got you here won't get you there. But we're asking them on the call. How did you hear about us? Or, or, or are we, you yeah. know? So, so yeah, you're hundred percent. That is correct. not, that is not attribution. There should be an attribution model. Our CRM does it. We request unlimited numbers. 
And that's real attribution. Not no, I agree 100%. Say, well, Google gets a lot of the results for radio and TV maybe, right? But here's the deal. What did your Google, it should have cheapened your acquisition costs because you're the highest quality score for your own name. So those should be very, very cheap acquisition costs. So your pay-per-click should go dramatically down when you're doing TV, radio, billboards. And you got to have attribution for everything. Scorecards for your marketing. And once these scorecards and these KPIs are delivered and they're accurate, man, you can start sprinting in your business. And this might sound daunting to a lot of people, but I just said four KPIs that matter. And if you build systems around those, there's deeper ones, but those are the four that matter. And all of a sudden you'll say, man, I know exactly what I need to do. And this is where I should be spending my time and hiring for these. And it, it all of a sudden becomes systematic and it's, it's fun and it, it's vanilla. It's boring. You know how many, the top two types of ice cream, chocolate and vanilla. And there's all these other flavors, but if you could just get good at vanilla, right. it's the number one seller. And so many people, I'll tell you this in landscaping too, as they start specializing in all this other shit, get really good at one thing. Really, really, really freaking good until you go into these other things and say, I could do that. I could do that. I'll figure out a way to build this retaining wall and all this other shit that you suck at. And you should have bid <laughs> it 10 times more because of all the mistakes. So so focus on one thing and learn how to say no. Learn how to say that I'm not ready to start that yet. Because when we're small, we say yes to everything because we need money. Yep. And the first 10 years of your business, if you're like me, it's all sweat equity. You got to do the work because you can't hire the great people you need. And and then if you can't hire a really good CFO, which I recommend doing early on, is hire a fractional CFO. Get somebody that costs five hundred thousand a year that works with you ten hours, so it costs you one hundred twenty five thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. But all of a sudden you go, holy shit! There's tax loopholes. There's the cost segregation study when I buy a building. There's accelerated depreciation. I should be using this credit card. I I didn't use any of this co op. I didn't even think about that I could do this. I could get a grant from the city I'm in for this. A great CFO will help you recognize that and know your financial position each week. And you can't undermine what a great person in charge of your uh, money can do for you. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times we yeah. cop out on that. Yeah, we, we talk get, about that a lot, man. Get, you got to get a good, good CPA on your team, you know, whether you outsource that or it's an in, in-house. And there's so many things. And, and again, we hear that all the time. I can't afford it. I'm like, you can't afford not to. You don't even know. What you're missing out here? You're you're missing out on you so said much. That you said you said you, you were bragging revenues for vanity, profits for sanity. You used to tell everybody, "Man, I'm doing ten million, but they didn't know you were writing yourself checks to the business because it would look like it was amazing. I see your trucks everywhere. Little did they know you weren't even making a profit. Yeah. You were literally losing money. Yeah, and it, a lot of people are like that. Absolutely, and then, you know, you, best thing that ever happened, and we learned a lot. Um, Tommy, we've taken like an hour of your time, which um, or even longer. I could we could do this all day. I, I'm gonna. I need business lessons, and I feel, and I feel like I, I'm like, should I thought I had my shit together? Need to get your shit together. Now I, too, my, you? now I gotta up, I gotta elevate again. Um, yeah. So Tommy, we're at the hour, and I know your time's valuable. But we, we do have one question we ask every guest on here, and we'll ask you as well. What's the best business advice you've ever been given? All right, the best advice in the world. Get ready for it. We're ready. Is I don't like just going to other shops. I like going to a different state and having a whole four pages of questions. And if you ask, you shall receive. Don't be afraid to ask. You got to ask. And I would go to, sometimes it's not even the same industry, but a lot of people feel like they got to pay it forward that are successful. You guys have a podcast, you're paying it forward. If somebody was to go to one of you guys and say, can I, came out, come, can I come hang out with a day? I won't get in the way. I want to ask Maybe your trainers or your lead tech or whatever it might be some questions. I want to find out a few things about marketing. I promise you I won't be. Uh, I'm a big fan of yours and I won't get in the way. The days that I got out of my own problems, which is the firefighting, and I'd go just learn with an open ear about success of other companies, I'd come back and I'd implement these things day one. I'd go, we've got a plan. Let's get there. And then I start sharing with my managers, go to this shop and learn from them because we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So go to the biggest, most successful company you could find, do a ride along, go to their shop, ask the questions, talk to the CFO or the CMO or, or the general manager, because they will help you and you will have this aha moment, but then go back and actually implement it. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's I agree. awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I got a guy coming uh, tomorrow from uh, Pittsburgh, just going to spend a couple of days at Perfect Cut. He wants to see our facilities, kind of watch how we flow. And, uh, you know, I'll get to spend a little, little time with him. He's a great dude. He was actually Aaron Ashton, who was on our podcast. Oh, yeah. uh, he's going to come out. 
from Thunderbird. He's going to come out and, and uh, we'll spend a couple of days with him. And, uh, yeah, I mean, always trying to give back. And, and hopefully he, he goes back and implements a few things in his company to, to, to elevate him. But, um, yeah, Tommy, I, we, man, I really appreciate you spending some time with us. I know you're crazy busy. I was almost uh, didn't want to ask you to, to spend some time with us because I know you're running a, a major operation there and, and busy. But, uh, man, great information. hope our listeners can take away. I'm going to have to listen to this one a couple times. Yeah, it's a great one. Outstanding. Well, listen, if anybody wants to reach out, um, you could do my email, a1leadmanager at gmail. That's the easiest one, a1leadmanager. I wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Home Service Millionaire. In that book, I got 12 of my best mentors to add to the book because it was really shitty until I got them to add to it. <laughs> and um, and then I, I put a lot of funny stuff, uh, good stuff on TikTok and Instagram at official Tommy Mello. And I don't plug myself. I just literally, if you guys watch what I'm doing, I'm literally giving back. And people go, why do you share all your secrets? And I'm like, listen, there's more than enough water in the ocean for everybody. And the more I give, the more it feels like people want to give back. And it's amazing when your mindset changes to a mindset of abundance and that there's enough for everybody to win and elevate everybody around you. And I got a lot, a lot of work to do. A lot of work. I, I, I'm the best I've ever been, the, but the worst I'll ever be. So that's awesome. I'm always here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna that's say. It. I was gonna say. You know, how, how do our listeners get a hold of you? But man, he just gave his freaking personal email. <laughs> so if you guys uh, don't think that you know, that's that's what's amazing about about this industry and, and guys that are giving back to the community. And I say it all the time: the more I give back, the more I get in return. You know, people email me all the time. Um, I. I answer every email. It takes me sometimes a couple of days and Lira answers every time you guys send us messages on Instagram and different things. So man, how awesome is that? You guys can get a hold of him. Check him out on Instagram as well. Guys, we drop a new episode of the green grind every Tuesday. Um, if you think you'd want to be a guest or know someone that wants to be a guest, you can jump on the Ballard website. We've got a quick link right there. You can fill out your information or you can shoot us a message on Instagram or Facebook or wherever you want to get a hold of us. So we appreciate Jobber being a sponsor. And Tommy, man, we really appreciate your time today. Um, I tell you best of luck, but you don't need any luck, man. You're going you're gonna to keep kicking, kicking ass. ass and taking names. So awesome. Thanks hey, so much, thank Tommy. You both. This was great. Sometimes it's great to just be on a podcast because I took a lot of notes. And like I'm giving a, a speech uh, Wednesday to the guys that do the soft washing. So now you guys just helped build my PowerPoint of a few things, but <laughs> you guys are great. I appreciate the time. And uh, I wish you both, I, you don't need luck either, but uh, you know, break a leg out there. All right. Buddy. Thanks so much, Tommy. Take care, buddy. Have a good day. Bye. See you. Bye. Thanks, See you. guys.